This is the first in a series of six videos on how to enhance your learning. In part one, we're going to talk about memory. Everything I'm going to be presenting can be found in one or more of the books that I have listed on this page. The human brain is only 2% of the body's weight, but it uses 20% of the body's glucose and oxygen. If this energy supply is cut off, the brain is going to stop functioning in less than 10 seconds. This occurs, for instance, when a pilot pulls out of a dive too fast or you put someone in a centrifuge because the centrifugal force is too great for the heart to be able to pump blood to the brain. Since the brain needs so much of the body's glucose and oxygen, which is supplied by the circulatory system, we'll talk about the role of exercise in Part 5. Learning is more than just memorizing, but it has to begin with putting things in memory. We have two memory systems, a conscious memory system and a subconscious memory system, and each one uses different parts of the brain. Your subconscious memory involves things such as driving a car, riding a bike, typing on a keyboard. These are things that are motor or movement skills and things that you perform subconsciously. The conscious memory system consists of facts, meanings, concepts, and experiences. So for instance, the capital of France is something you have in long-term conscious memory. A uh, concert you attended is an experience that you have in long-term conscious memory. These two memory systems use different parts of the brain. So, for instance, the conscious memory uses the hippocampus and the frontal lobes. So, I want to talk a little bit about how these two memory systems were discovered and the role that the hippocampus plays in memory. In the 1950s, they were exploring the use of surgery to treat patients who had severe epilepsy that would not respond to drugs. So one patient, who is referred to as HM in the literature to protect his privacy, had his hippocampus removed. The surgery did greatly reduce HM's epileptic seizures, but it did have an effect on his memory. One of the researchers who worked with HM was Brenda Milner, and Brenda Milner would go in each day and work with HM. On the right is a picture of Brenda more than 50 years later lecturing, and even today in 2018, at age 100, she still teaches and does research. After the surgery, H.M. still maintained the memories he had pre-surgery. For instance, he remembered where he lived, where he grew up, who his friends are, but he was no longer able to move short-term memories to long-term memories. So the hippocampus is not where long-term memories are stored, but plays an essential role in the formation of new long-term conscious memories. So every day Brenda went in to work with H.M., to H.M. he was meeting Brenda for the first time. It's like the movie Fifty First Dates. In the movie, Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore meet and fall in love. When Adam Sandler shows up the next day, Drew Barrymore does not know who he is. Adam Sandler is informed that Drew Barrymore had been in an accident that affected her long-term memory. So every day, he has to get her to fall in love with him again. Working with H.M., Brenda discovered that we have two memory systems, a conscious memory system and a subconscious memory system. Although H.M. could not add conscious thoughts to long-term memory, Brenda discovered that he could 
add procedures to long-term memory. So as an example, let's assume that HM did not know how to ride a bike. So Brenda would go in there and say, HM, do you know how to ride a bike? And he would say no, and Brenda would say, well, let's learn. And they would work that day on how to ride a bike. She would then go in the next day and ask HM, do you know how to ride a bike? And he would say no, and they would proceed again to work on learning how to ride a bike. Eventually, HM knew how to ride a bike, but when Brenda would go in there and introduce herself and ask HM if he knew how to ride a bike, he had no recollection. He would say, no, I do not know how to ride a bike, but he could then get on the bike and ride it with no problem. The first study of memory was performed by Hermann Ebbinghaus in the 1880s. We'll see that his results reveal a very important studying technique. So what he did was create all these three-letter syllables where the first and third letter were consonants and the middle letter was a vowel. He then took a set of these and memorized them. Then a day later, he checked to see how many he remembered. Then he checked after two days, three days, etc., what he found was that there was an exponential decrease in the number of words he remembered, so there was some time constant to his forgetting. So this first curve represents the initial results of his first experiment. For his next experiment, he took a new set of words and memorized them. Then after one day, he checked how many he remembered. But now, what he did was take the list and rememorized it. Okay, then he waited a day and checked how many he remembered, waited another day, checked how many he remembered, and so forth. And what he found was he was still forgetting them exponentially, but now the time constant was longer. For his third experiment, he took a new set of words and memorized them, then checked how many he knew a day later. But now he rememorized his whole list. Then he waited to see how many he knew a day later. Then rememorized his list. Then checked how many he knew one day later. Then two days later. Then three days later. So again, he found he was forgetting them exponentially, but yet a longer time constant. When you can't recall something, it can be because the memory has disappeared or the memory is still there, but the retrieval has become harder. The current thinking about memory is that we have an unlimited storage capacity because your brain contains a hundred billion neurons and most of those can make connections to thousands of other neurons. So once something is really entrenched in memory, it's going to remain there. If you st stop accessing something in memory, the retrieval ability of that memory is going to fade. And the fading is because we actually need current information to be more accessible. For instance, about 10 years ago, I went to Scotland for the first time and rented a car. So... I had to drive on the left-hand side of the road instead of the right-hand side, and I had to shift with my left hand instead of my right hand. So I pulled out of the Edinburgh airport, and one of the first things I came to was this massive roundabout. And I pulled into it, and there was a lot of honking going on, and I was really glad I bought the extra insurance for the rental car. But in a day or two, I was very comfortable driving. I didn't even have to think about it anymore because the retrieval of driving on the right-hand side of the road and shifting with the right hand had faded and was replaced by driving on the left-hand side of the road and shifting with the left hand. It's easy to think of a situation where the memory is still there, but the difficulty is in retrieving the memory. For instance, let's say in third grade you had a good friend, and that friend moved away at the end of third grade, and 
say 15 years later you were trying to recall the name of that friend but you couldn't if you were shown a list of four names where three of them were names you never heard of and the fourth one was the name of your friend you would have no trouble at that point picking out the name of your friend from that list so you still had that name in permanent memory it was just a matter of finding some way to retrieve it Ebbinghaus's results reveal an important studying technique called spaced learning. So let me talk about and compare spaced learning with something that is called block learning. If you have a test next week, let's assume you want to study a total of seven hours. So the block studying method would be wait till the day before the exam and spend seven hours studying. And you can see when you go into the exam the next day, you will have forgotten quite a bit. And over the next few days, you will have forgotten almost everything. Now, block studying is a popular technique because the rapid gains are apparent, but the rapid forgetting is not. Ebbinghaus's results tell us a better way to study would be spend an hour each of the next seven days. So you learn a little bit each day, but you keep reinforcing so that when you get to the exam, you will know the material and you will also retain it after the exam. Learning is a function of the brain like strength is a function of a muscle. So if you want to get stronger and you want to lift weights, you're not going to go into the gym and lift weights for eight hours. You're going to go into the gym and lift weights for maybe an hour, then have a couple days to recover, go back in the gym and lift weights for an hour, and then a couple days to recover and uh, so forth. So your studying should be the same thing. You should spread it out over time. So you need to do spaced studying episodes. The forgetting that occurs between study episodes is a little like muscle breakdown. That forgetting makes the learning a little bit harder, but it strengthens the learning. Back in 1901, William James succinctly described the difference between blocked learning, which he called cramming, and spaced learning. He said, cramming seems to stamp things in by intense application before the ordeal, but a thing thus learned can form few associations. On the other hand, the same thing recurring on different days in different contexts, read, recited, referred to again and again, related to other things and reviewed, gets well wrought into the mental structure. Let's look at an experimental investigation of blocked versus spaced learning. The subjects are undergraduates, and they are going to be taught to find how many permutations there are of a given sequence. So, for instance, if the sequence is A, B, 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 C, C, the number of permutations, that is, writing uh, those six letters, A, B, B, C, B, C, A, B, C, B, C, B, etc., there are 60 ways of doing that. So each student is randomly assigned to one of four groups. So two of those groups are spacers and two of those groups are massers. So the massers are those who are going to be doing the blocked learning. So after learning the technique, this one group of spacers will be tested one week after learning the technique and another group four weeks. And for the massers, the same thing. One group will be tested one week after learning the material and the other group four weeks after learning the material. So the spacers have two sessions a week apart. In their first session they're taught how to find the number of permutations and then they're given five problems. So they're given a problem, they have 45 seconds to work it, and then they're shown the solution for 15 seconds. 
Then a week later, they're given five more problems. Now, the masters do everything in one session. They learn how to find the number of permutations, and then they're given ten problems. So the group of spacers that were tested one week after their final session scored 70%. The group of spacers that were tested four weeks after their last session scored 64%. Now, the massers who were tested one week after their session scored 75%, but those who were tested four weeks after their session scored only a 32%. So the advantage of doing space learning, even with just two space sessions, clearly shows the much improved retention of the material. Let's look at another example of a blocked versus spaced learning. This experiment looked at training of surgical residents in microsurgery. 38 surgical residents were randomly assigned to one of two groups. They were then given a series of four short lessons in microsurgery. Group 1 completed all four lessons in one day, which is the common teaching practice. Group 2 had each lesson spaced by a week. Both groups were tested one month after the last lesson. The test was to reattach the pulsating severed aorta of a rat. The block group scored lower on all measures than the spacers. The amount of time it took them to do the surgery, the number of hand movements needed, and the overall surgical success. 16% of the blocked learners damaged the aortas beyond repair. All the spaced group learners were successful in reattaching the severed aortas. In part two, I will talk about your study environment, a technique known as interleaving, and focused and diffused mode thinking.